In this module, we are going to discuss about the echocardiographic assessment of patent ductus arteriosus. PDA is a communication between the distal aortic arch and the pulmonary artery bifurcation. This module will discuss how to image a PDA on echocardiogram, illustrate different types of PDA like a restrictive PDA, a moderate sized PDA, a very large PDA and illustrate the different hemodynamics of PDA. The echocardiographic views of the PDA primarily is through high left parasternal view which is called as the ductal view and the suprasternal view. We will also show during the echocardiographic views how to assess the Doppler flows across the ductus and how to measure the ductus for the purpose of intervention. Conventionally, an echocardiogram starts with the long axis view imaging of the heart. On parasternal long axis view, we place the probe along the long axis of the heart. The long axis of the heart lies along the line from the base of the heart to the apex of the heart. The base of the heart will be at the level of aortic annulus. The adjacent echo video of a parasternal long axis view shows the long axis view of the left ventricle which shows the left ventricular inflow and the left ventricular outflow. When we talk about the ductal view, it is a modification from the parasternal long axis view. The ductus arteriosus has to be imaged by keeping the probe in a sagittal plane of the patient. So we need to move the probe superiorly to the left first or second intercostal space close to the manipriosternal junction and keep the probe in sagittal plane. It's only in sagittal plane we'll be getting the entire main pulmonary artery opened out. The ductus will be seen to insert onto the pulmonary artery bifurcation as shown in the video. On the cartoon shown on the left side we identify the ductus is a structure that arises from the anterior wall of the proximal descending aorta and getting inserted in the PA bifurcation. The plane of the ductus arteriosus is in the sagittal axis of the heart, sagittal plane of the patient. On the right sided cartoon, we show where we keep the echocardiographic probe and anatomically show the location of the right ventricular outflow tract, the pulmonary valve, main pulmonary artery, posteriorly the ductus arteriosus and the descending thoracic aorta. By keeping the echocardiographic probe in that location, we are going to get a picture which is more or less representative of the same anatomic structures. On the right side, we are showing a model of the echocardiographic image. We see an exactly similar image on the ductal view as shown in the adjacent video. Once we identify the ductus in the ductal view, then we magnify the region of the ductus to get a better visualization of the ductus arteriosus. This left parasternal view taken in sagittal plane from the left first or second intercostal space will be called as the ductal view. Once we get this ductal view, this shows the 
long axis of the ductus. That means from the posterior end of the ductus to the anterior pulmonary artery end of the ductus, the entire ductus is displayed. Once we get this view, we can freeze the frame which has got the maximum size of the ductus and then measure it. This is how a ductus is measured at the pulmonary artery end. Cursors are placed on either end of the ductus in this ductal view and the measurement is taken. In this short axis view of the ductus, we are exactly perpendicular to the previous plane. The previous ductal view was along the sagittal plane and here we are at a horizontal plane. On the cartoon that is shown on the right side, we can identify the ductus arising from the anterior wall of the descending thoracic aorta and inserting in the pulmonary artery bifurcation. So when we visualize the ductus in its short axis, we will be getting a picture similar to one shown on the right side. You can see the right ventricular outflow tract, the pulmonary valve, the main pulmonary artery, the pulmonary artery bifurcation and the ductus inserting onto the posterior regions of the main pulmonary artery bifurcation. And you will see the descending thoracic aorta more posteriorly. This video will be the short axis view of the ductus. You notice the ascending aorta on the right side of the screen, the main pulmonary artery bifurcating into right and left. You can see the continuous flow of the ductus into the main pulmonary artery. When we magnify the region of the ductus, you'll be able to see very clearly the pulmonary artery bifurcation into right and left pulmonary artery, the ductus arteriosus and the descending thoracic aorta. Whenever there is a large left right shunt, the entire main pulmonary artery will be filled with the continuous color flows and so the ductus may remain obscure. So we are showing an example of a patient who had an entirely right to left shunt across the ductus arteriosus to show the anatomic location of the ductus and its relation to the pulmonary artery bifurcation and descending thoracic aorta. On the cartoon that is shown, you can identify the ductus. It connects the pulmonary artery bifurcation to the descending thoracic aorta. Since this PDA is a very hypertensive PDA, with pulmonary artery pressures more than the aortic pressures, we are able to see a continuous flow from the pulmonary artery into the descending aorta. On a short axis view, the ductus is again measured. This measurement will give the width of the ductus. The measurement of the ductus from the right end to the left end. The previous measurement that we took on the long axis on the sagittal plane will refer to the dimension of the ductus between the superior end and the inferior end or the upper end and the lower end. So the narrow pulmonary end of the ductus arteriosus is measured in two different views. One will be in the short axis where we will be recording the dimension of the ductus from the right end to the left end. The second will be on the long axis that is the ductal view where we will be measuring it from the upper end to the lower end. Now we will move on to analyzing the aortic end of the ductus arteriosus. The aortic end of the ductus is seen from the suprasternal view. Once again, in suprasternal view, if you want to visualize the entire aortic arch from the ascending aorta to the descending aorta, we need to keep the probe in an oblique plane 
to cut along the aortic arch in its long axis. However, the duct is a structure that arises from the anterior wall of the descending thoracic aorta and causing directly anteriorly in sagittal plane. So the same view which is going to display the entire aortic arch from ascending aorta to arch to descending aorta is not going to display the entire ductus arteriosus. We need to shift the plane of the echocardiographic probe to a more sagittal plane to get the ductus arteriosus. So we start with visualization of the aortic arch in its long axis by keeping the probe a little oblique in the suprasternal echo window. We'll start to visualize the whole of the aortic arch from the ascending aorta to the descending aorta and visualize all the arch branches. This is the suprasternal view of the aortic arch in its long axis. The probe is kept in the suprasternal window in our oblique plane. We can identify the whole of the aortic arch and the arch vessels coming off the arch. This view is primarily used for excluding a posterior aortic shelf. If a patient with ductus arteriosus is also having a posterior aortic shelf or a substrate for coarctation, it is best identified in this view. This is going to clearly show the entire aortic arch and the descending thoracic aorta. In this example shown, there is a posterior aortic shell. We are able to identify the dilated main pulmonary artery, the descending thoracic aorta, and the ductus arteriosus. And exactly opposite to the ductus arteriosus on the posterior wall of the descending thoracic aorta, there is a deep posterior aortic shelf. This is a strong substrate of coarctation. We can see the flow of ductus arteriosus, it's a laminar flow indicating the pressures in the pulmonary artery and the pressures in the aorta are more or less similar. We can also appreciate the deep posterior aortic shelf. We should measure the aortic dimension in the proximal descending thoracic aorta where the ductus is originating. This measurement of the aorta opposite to the duct taken in the suprasternal long axis of the aortic arch will give a rough idea about how large a device can be placed in the ductus arteriosus. If this dimension is very small, a larger ductus to occlude, a larger device to occlude the ductus arteriosus may compromise on the aortic lumen. From this suprasternal long axis view that views the aorta along its long axis from the ascending aorta to descending aorta, we modify our view by moving the probe to a more sagittal plane. When we move the probe to a more sagittal plane, we'll be visualizing the proximal descending thoracic aorta, the entire ductus and the distal main pulmonary artery. So this will be the suprasternal ductal view. In the suprasternal ductal view, we see the distal portions of the aortic arch and the proximal descending thoracic aorta, the aortic end of the PDA far more clearly. We need to bring the probe in the suprasternal view to a more sagittal plane to get this picture. Once we get the ductus in the suprasternal ductal view, we then magnify on the region of the ductus to get a better visualization and then start measuring the ductus. We can appreciate the proximal portion of the descending thoracic aorta, the aortic end of the ductus, the length and width of the ductus, 
and its insertion in the pulmonary artery bifurcation in this view. Once we get the suprasternal view of the entire length of the ductus, then we freeze the frame and record the dimensions of the ductus in its widest dimension. This is a good view to measure the length of the ductus also. In this example that is shown, the ductus is more tubular. It has got more or less the same width from the aortic end to the pulmonary end. However, it's almost a centimeter long. These long tubular ducts are better recognized from the suprasternal ductal views. Some of the ductus may be very large. The dimension of the ductus may be even larger than the isthmus of the iota. We need to measure the ductus in all the dimensions, in all the directions, including the parasternal ductal view the suprasternal ductal view and take the maximum dimension of the ductus to decide on the size of the device that is going to be used. Ductus is an expansive structure and so we need to scroll the image throughout the cardiac cycle and try to find out the maximum expansile diameter of the ductus. The maximal ductal diameter will be seen in N systole. You can see that in this picture, we have scrolled the ductus and identified the maximum size of the ductus in the N systolic frame. The ECG that has been shown below shows the point of the echocardiographic frame, which is almost falling on the T-wave, corresponding to the end of systole. So the measurement of ductus arteriosus is done primarily in three views. The parasternal long axis ductal view, where we measure between the upper end of the pulmonary end to the lower end of the pulmonary end. The parasternal short axis view, where we measure from the right end of the pulmonary end to the left end of the pulmonary end and the suprasternal view, which we mentioned the last. Any ductus arteriosus that is arising from the left aortic arch, from the region of the junction between the arch and descending thoracic aorta, and inserting into the pulmonary artery bifurcation, should be seen very clearly on the ductal views and in the suprasternal ductal views. If a ductus is not getting visualized in these views, that means morphologically this ductus is not originating in the conventional plane. We show an example here of a pulmonary artery bifurcation. The main pulmonary artery divides into the right and left pulmonary artery and we notice the ductus inserting far more to the right side. It's almost inserting in the right pulmonary artery. So whenever a ductus is noted in these planes, it's an indicator that the ductal morphology is completely not normal. We can notice that the ductus is inserting far more deeper into the right pulmonary artery rather than in the region of pulmonary artery bifurcation. This ductus was actually more on the right side of the mediastinum. In this patient, there was an isolation of the right subclavian artery. And the right subclavian artery was connected to the proximal right pulmonary artery through an abnormal ductus. These ductus will be inserting in an entirely different plane and will not be visualized on the standard parasternal ductal views and suprasternal ductal views. So whenever we are not able to visualize the ductus in the conventional views, then a completely different ductal morphology 
should be suspected. Yet another reason for an abnormal morphology of the PDA is shown here. This example shows a right aortic arch. The ductus is arising from the left denominate artery and inserting more into the origin of the right pulmonary artery. So once again, these set of abnormal PDAs will not be visualized properly in the standard parasternal ductal views and the suprasternal ductal views. So a ductus that is not getting visualized in the usual parasternal and suprasternal ductal views should alert the clinician about a totally different morphology of the ductus arteriosus. Yet another cause of an abnormal PDA course on echocardiography, a patient with a right descending thoracic iota, the long tubular ductus arising from the mid thoracic iota and ascending up in the mediastinum and getting inserted in the pulmonary artery bifurcation. Once again, these ductus will not be visualized along its entire length and width in the standard ductal views and the standard suprasternal views. We will now move on to illustrate examples of restrictive ductus, moderate sized and large sized ductus and hypertensive PDA. This ductal view shows a very restrictive patent ductus arteriosus. We are able to identify the main pulmonary artery, a small ductus arteriosus that gets inserted into the pulmonary artery bifurcation and the flows in the descending thoracic aorta. On measuring the narrow pulmonary end of this restrictive PDA, we note that the pulmonary end of the PDA is around 2 millimeters. This is the feature of a restrictive small PDA. On a short axis view, we notice the pulmonary artery bifurcation and then when we sweep the transducer a little bit more superiorly, we notice the origin of the small restrictive ductus arteriosus from the anterior wall of the descending thoracic aorta and inserting on to the PA bifurcation. The ductus in a parasternal short axis view will be visualized only when we sweep the transducer a little bit more superiorly than the level of the PA bifurcation. When we measure the gradients with a continuous wave Doppler, we notice that the gradients are in the range of around 5 to 6 meter per second. This is a feature of a restrictive ductus because the pulmonary artery pressures will be normal. Also notice that the end diastolic gradient is around 52 millimeters of mercury, which once again is a pointer towards normal pulmonary artery pressures. From the suprasternal view, when we visualize the entire long axis of the aortic arch, we see the ascending aorta, the arch descending aorta and the arch branches. We notice that the flows in the proximal descending thoracic aorta is normal. There is no diastolic flow reversal. Lack of a diastolic flow reversal is a feature of a restrictive small PDA. If the PDA is larger, there will be diastolic flow reversal in the descending thoracic aorta back into the ductus. In a restrictive small ductus, when you do an apical four chamber view, you identify that the left atrium and left ventricle will only be very minimally be dilated. The dilatation of left atrium and left ventricle in a ductus arteriosus will be proportionate to the quantum of the shunt through the ductus arteriosus. If there is a large shunt through the ductus arteriosus, the left atrium and left ventricle will be markedly be dilated. However, in small restrictive PDA, there will be very minimal LA-LV dilatation. After seeing a restrictive small PDA. Now we go on to visualization of a moderate sized ductus. This is the ductal view. The ductal 
view is taken from the parasternal left first or second intercostal space by keeping the probe in the sagittal plane. We are able to appreciate the pulmonary valve, the main pulmonary artery. The entire ductus is shown. We are able to appreciate the proximal descending thoracic aorta. The ductus is seen from the aortic end to the pulmonary artery end. After visualizing the ductus in the parasternal long axis ductal view, we magnify in the region of the ductus to take the measurements. The measurement of the PDA in this example is close to 3.6 millimeters. This is an indicator of a moderate sized ductus arteriosus. When we take a Doppler gradient from the aorta to pulmonary artery with continuous wave Doppler, we identify here that the diastolic gradients are around 28 millimeters of mercury. This is an indicator of mild to moderate pulmonary arterial hypertension. If you imagine that the aortic diastolic pressure is going to be somewhere around 70 to 80 millimeters of mercury, the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure predicted by this echocardiographic gradient is in the range of 45 to 50 millimeters of mercury. And this will be an indicator of moderate pulmonary arterial hypertension. When we see the apical four chamber view in these patients, there is more dilatation of the left atrium and left ventricle. As we stressed earlier, the quantum of left right shunt through the ductus arteriosus will dictate the extent of dilatation of the left atrium and left ventricle. Now we move on to visualization of a large PDA with a significant left right shunt. This is a magnified ductal view of a large PDA. You can see the descending thoracic aorta distally, a large ductus inserting into the pulmonary artery bifurcation. The measurement of this ductus in the same ductal view shows a dimension of around 6.4 millimeters. On a short axis view, in a magnified picture, we can see the dilated descending thoracic aorta, the ductus arteriosus. The ductus has got a small ampulla and the pulmonary artery bifurcation is shown. On a color compare mode in the short axis, we can identify the abundant flow from the descending thoracic aorta into the pulmonary artery bifurcation through this large ductus arteriosus. The ductus is also measured from the suprasternal view that was described earlier. This is the suprasternal ductal view. Again, the region of the ductus is magnified. We get a similar dimension of around six and a half millimeters. When we analyze the Doppler gradients, of these large PDAs with torrential blood flow from the aorta into the pulmonary artery, we notice that there is a very high systolic gradients. In this patient, the peak systolic gradient of the continuous wave Doppler signal along the ductus arteriosus is close to 3.3 meter per second. This gives a Doppler derived gradient of around 43 millimeters of mercury. This does not mean the pulmonary artery systolic pressure is around 43 millimeters of mercury lower than the aortic systolic pressure. Whenever there is a large flow through a ductus arteriosus, the high velocity of the flow is going to cause a high gradients recorded with continuous wave Doppler. So we should not try to underestimate the pulmonary artery systolic pressures in this patient by just subtracting the peak systolic ductal gradient from the aortic systolic pressure.
the ductal peak systolic gradient will falsely be exaggerated due to the large flows and its high velocity. However, what is useful is the end diastolic gradient. You notice that in end of diastole, the gradient from the iota to pulmonary artery is less than 1 meter per second, which means the diastolic pressures in the iota and pulmonary artery are more or less similar. This will clearly indicate that the pulmonary artery pressures are similar to aortic pressures and the patient has got severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. This will be a hyperkinetic, flow dependent, severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. From the suprasternal view, we take the long axis of the aortic arch. We can see the entire ascending aorta, the arch branches and the descending thoracic aorta. This view is taken primarily to exclude a posterior aortic shelf and to measure the aortic dimension, the region of the aorta opposite to the ductus. When we do a color Doppler interrogation, we can notice a flow reversal in the descending thoracic aorta into the ductus arteriosus. We note that in diastole, there is a flow convergence of the blood towards the aortic end of the ductus arteriosus. The blood from the ascending and arch of the aorta enters the ductus with a blue color and the blood from the descending thoracic aorta is reversed into the ductus with a red color. So this convergence of the blood from the arch of the aorta and the descending thoracic aorta towards the ductus is a feature of large aortopulmonary runoff or a large shunt through the ductus arteriosus. When we visualize the aortic and left atrial dimensions on a mode, the left atrial left ventricular dilatation that's a characteristic of a large PDA will result in a larger left atrial dimensions. In fact, this is one of the techniques used in neonatal cardiology where a preterm ductus is screened for. When a premature baby gets an echocardiogram and a dilated left atrium is identified, it is an indirect indicator towards the presence of a ductus arteriosus with a large left right channel. However, we need to identify that the aortic root also gets dilated in patients with ductus arteriosus with passage of time. And unlike ventricular septal defects where the ascending aorta remains normal in its size, in a ductus arteriosus, the ascending aorta also enlarges. Dilatation of the left ventricle is an indirect evidence of the magnitude of left right shunt through the ductus arteriosus. If there is a large left right shunt, it will result in significant LALV dilatation and the left ventricle will have large internal dimensions in diastole. In this M mode taken from a small one year old child, the left ventricle internal dimension is as big as 5.23 centimeters. It's an indicator of significant dilatation of the left ventricle due to a large flow of blood from the iota into the pulmonary artery through a large ductus arteriosus. Significant dilatation of the left atrium and left ventricle as seen from the apical view is a characteristic feature of a large ductus with a large left right shunt. Having seen different sizes of the ductus, originally a restrictive small ductus and then moved on to the moderate sized ductus and large ductus, let us now concentrate on the ductal morphology. While most of the ductus are relatively conical, the broader aortic end and narrower pulmonary artery end, there are two major differences in the morphology which we need to stress on. One will be the ductus with a very long tubular course and the second will be a ductus with no ampulla at all which is described as the window-like duct. So we are going to show some examples of a tubular duct and the window-like duct. 
This is an example of a tubular duct. This is the magnified parasternal ductal view. You can identify the descending thoracic aorta distally, the tubular ductus. The ductus has got more or less the same dimension from the aortic to pulmonary artery end. Inserting into the PA bifurcation, we can see a large dilated main pulmonary artery. This tubular ductus has got a dimension of around 5 millimeters. While most of the ductus are conical with a narrow pulmonary artery end, here we can identify that the ductus has got more or less the same width along its entire course. A measurement of a tubular duct is taken at various levels. The pulmonary artery and the middle of the ductus and the aortic end and all the dimensions will more or less be similar. When we look at the ductal flow in the long axis or in the parasternal ductal view, we can identify that the color jet through the ductus arteriosus also is sort of tubular, has got the same width from the aorta to the pulmonary artery end. The importance of identifying this tubular morphology is in the field of interventions. Tubular ductus will need a difference in the strategy during interventional ductal closure. An example of a tubular ductus in the color compare mode. In the conventional ductus arteriosus, which is conical with a broader aortic end and a narrower pulmonary end, if the pulmonary end is around 6 millimeters, usually the ductus is closed with an 8-6 duct occluder device. However, if the same ductus is a tubular duct with the same 6 millimeter diameter, an 8-6 ductal device will not completely occlude this ductus arteriosus, will need a significant oversizing or sometimes an entirely different strategy. When we do a continuous wave Doppler evaluation of the flows through these large tubular ducts, we can identify a very high peak systolic gradients. In this example, we see the peak systolic velocities are more than 4 meters per second and the peak systolic gradient from the iota to pulmonary artery is close to 72 millimeters of mercury. As we stressed earlier, the high gradients and the high velocity that is being recorded is due to the high velocity of blood flows and a large shunt from the iota to the pulmonary artery. This will not equate to the true aortic systolic to pulmonary artery systolic pressure difference. When we visualize the end diastolic gradient, we find that it's only around 2 meters per second, which means the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure is only 16 millimeters of mercury less than the aortic diastolic pressure. So if we imagine the aortic diastolic pressure is somewhere around 70 millimeters of mercury, the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure is around 54 millimeters of mercury, which will indicate severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. So we should understand the fallacy of measuring the ductus arteriosus peak systolic gradients on continuous wave Doppler. The peak systolic gradient across the ductus arteriosus is an indicator of the magnitude of the flow. If there is a large flow, we are going to get a high velocity jet and high gradients recorded. This will not really reflect the pressure between the aortic systolic and pulmonary artery systolic pressures. When taking the dimensions of these long tubular ducts, we should measure the length of the ductus also. Most of the conventional duct occluder devices have got a length of around 7 millimeters only. And if the length of the ductus is much, much longer than the size of a duct occluder device, then that also has to be factored when we choose a device for occluding this ductus. In this example, we notice that the length of this long tubular 
PDA is close to a centimeter. Measurement of another tubular long PDA, the length of the ductus is close to 11 millimeter. Some tubular PDAs may have a very mild constriction at the pulmonary artery end. That also needs to be noted to identify the strategy of closing this ductus by intervention. Suprasternal long axis view along the aortic arch shows the entire ascending aorta arch and the descending aorta with the arch vessel branches. We can notice the flow convergence of the blood in diastole from the arch of the aorta and the descending thoracic aorta towards the aortic end of the ductus arteriosus. The blood in the descending thoracic aorta in diastole flows in a reverse direction towards the aortic end of the ductus arteriosus and the blood in the aortic arch flows towards the aortic end of the ductus arteriosus. So this causes the convergence of a blue color from the distal aortic arch and a red color in the proximal thoracic aorta towards the aortic end of the ductus arteriosus. In all the preceding examples, we had been showing a morphology of a PDA, which is more tubular. Tubular PDAs are the PDAs which has got a long tubular morphology with the aortic end and pulmonary end almost similar in its dimensions. The other end of the spectrum of morphology will be the window-like PDA. Here there is no ductal ampulla at all. And the ductus is more like a window between the distal aortic arch and the pulmonary artery bifurcation. In this ductal view of a patient with a large window-like ductus, we can notice the descending thoracic aorta, the main pulmonary artery, and there is a very large ductus with a bidirectional flow. We are not able to appreciate a length for this ductus arteriosus at all. This is a window-like PDA. When we magnify on the ductal view, we can identify that there is no distance between the descending thoracic aorta and the pulmonary artery bifurcation. And the ductus is more like an aortopulmonary window. When we view the same window-like PDA from the suprasternal view, we notice the distal aortic arch. There is a window-like ductus, a large ductus, from the anterior wall of the proximal descending thoracic aorta, communicating with the main pulmonary artery near its bifurcation. There is no length to the ampulla of this window-like ductus. This suprasternal ductal view clearly shows the lack of a ductal ampulla. These window-like ducts are very short. They don't have a length at all. But some of them may be very large in their diameter that the aortic pressure and the pulmonary artery pressure will be similar. In this suprasternal view, you can notice a laminar flow of blood from the aorta towards the pulmonary artery without any gradient. This indicates that the pulmonary artery pressures and the aortic pressures are similar. In the same patient with the window-like large ductus, we can notice that there is not much of left atrial and left ventricular dilatation. Since the ductus is too large and leads to early development of elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, the quantum of left right shunt is not torrential like the ductus that we showed earlier. So the left atrial and left ventricular dilatation which are dependent on the quantum of left right shunt through the ductus arteriosus is very less in these patients.
on interrogation of the tricuspid regurgitation jet, we can get a rough idea about the right ventricular systolic pressure. Here it is 103 millimeters of mercury added to the right atrial pressure. And we notice that there is severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. The window-like ducts lead to early onset of severe pulmonary hypertension and marked elevation of the pulmonary vascular resistance. They are difficult to image on echocardiography and so are most likely to be missed. Many of these patients may be followed for years as idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension. In the last example of the window-like ductus, we also demonstrated the features of elevated pulmonary vascular resistance by showing absence of left atrial and left ventricular dilatation, laminar low velocity flows from the iota into the pulmonary artery, lack of turbulence in the main pulmonary artery due to similar pressures in the iota and pulmonary artery. Now let us move on to demonstration of a typical hypertensive PDA. This is the left parasternal ductal view. The right ventricular outflow tract, the pulmonary valve, dilated main pulmonary artery are shown. A ductus arteriosus communicates to the descending thoracic iota and the flow in the PDA is entirely right to left. This is a feature of hypertensive PDA. When we visualize the short axis view of patients with this hypertensive PDA, we can notice that the blood flows from the main pulmonary artery towards the descending thoracic iota distally. There is no flow from the descending thoracic iota back into the main pulmonary artery at all. This is an indicator that the pulmonary artery systolic and diastolic pressures are marginally higher than the aortic systolic and diastolic pressures and there is complete right to left shunt. An example of a very large ductus arteriosus in a small baby who presented with marked lower limb desaturation. We notice a complete right to left shunt across the ductus arteriosus. The blue flow in the ductus arteriosus is an indicator of flow from the main pulmonary artery into the descending thoracic iota. When we view from the suprasternal ductal view, once again we notice that there is a complete flow reversal. The blood flows from the main pulmonary artery through the ductus into the descending thoracic iota. When we interrogate the continuous wave Doppler signal through the ductus arteriosus, we notice that the entire flow is right to left and the spectral Doppler signal is clearly seen below the baseline, indicative of flows from the main pulmonary artery through the ductus into the descending thoracic iota. The flow across the ductus arteriosus is totally right to left. There is no left right flow at all. This is the feature of a truly hypertensive patent ductus arteriosus. When we analyze the epical four chamber view, we find that there is no left atrial and left ventricular dilatation at all. On the contrary, the right atrium and right ventricular are distended. The right ventricular systolic contractility is impaired and there is a tricuspid regurgitation due to this reduced right ventricular systolic function and the tricuspid annular dilatation. When we look at the MO dimensions of these patients, we notice that the left ventricle is not dilated at all. The left ventricular dimensions are nearly normal. In a high left parasternal ductal view, a magnified view of a hypertensive ductus shows that it's a long, large, tubular ductus. The flow in this long, large, tubular ductus is mostly right to left with very occasional flashes of red indicative of very transient left right shunts. In that long tubular PDA, 
there is no left atrial and left ventricular dilatation which indicates that the left right shunt through the ductus is very very insignificant in these patients we can do a hemodynamic assessment in the echocardiographic lab by beginning to administer oxygen after starting face mask oxygen at around 10 liters per minute in the same patient we notice the change of the flow pattern the ductus which was seen in the previous frames to entirely shunt right to left begins to reverse and now there is a flow of blood from the descending thoracic aorta back into the main pulmonary artery we can notice a red flow into the main pulmonary artery after continuing the oxygen for a little longer time we notice that there is a complete reversal of the flow of that hypertensive PDA the ductus which was primarily shunting right to left in room air is now shunting entirely left right on oxygen in this module so far we had seen about how to visualize the ductus arteriosus on the ductal views from the high parasternal window and suprasternal window and showed examples of small moderate and large ductus arteriosus showed the differences in the morphology between a tubular ductus and a window like ductus and went on to describe what is a hypertensive PDA and how the hemodynamics of a hypertensive PDA can be changed in the echocardiographic lab by administering oxygen and documenting the reversal of the shunt from originally right to left to left to right on oxygen. Ductus arteriosus today are largely closed by interventional methods and when we analyze a patient after an interventional ductal closure we need to look at the echocardiogram for features like residual PDA, branch pulmonary artery narrowing and aortic arch narrowing. After device closure of the ductus, on a parasternal short axis view, we should identify the branch pulmonary arteries and identify normal flows in the right and left pulmonary artery. In most of the patients, after an interventional closure of the ductus arteriosus, we can notice that the left pulmonary artery flows show a very minimal turbulence. The velocities of blood flow along the left pulmonary artery may still be normal, but often it will be marginally be higher than the right pulmonary artery. This is not of major concern. When we magnify the parasternal short axis view and visualize the right and the left pulmonary artery, we can clearly identify an adequate lumen of the left pulmonary artery. However, the color wave Doppler shows a very subtle turbulence of blood flows in the left pulmonary artery. This minimal flow accelerations in the left pulmonary artery is not of major significance. When a large PDA in a relatively smaller patient is closed with the duct occluder device, we can often find the echogenic metallic device seen in the long axis of the aortic arch with very minimal flow acceleration. But these gradients recorded may not be clinically be significant. The pressures between the ascending aorta and descending aorta will in most of the patients be very similar. When we measure the Doppler gradients across the distal arch in these patients after an interventional device closure of the ductus, we will notice a mild flow acceleration in the arch. In this example, we see a velocity of around 2.4 meter per second, giving a peak gradient of around 23 millimeters of mercury. 
However, we notice that there is no diastolic gradient at all. These patients will have normally palpable femoral arteries. And the clinical blood pressure between the arm and the leg will be very similar. So this high velocity that we are getting in cystural in a post-interventional ductal patient is not of major concern. A ductus arteriosus can be of different sizes. It may be small, it may be moderate, it may be large. The morphology may differ from a window-like ductus to a long tubular ductus. The hemodynamics may differ from a clear large left right shunt to a bidirectional or entirely right left shunt. And we need to notice that in the post-interventional evaluation of a ductus arteriosus, we have to look at residual PDF flows, left pulmonary artery narrowing and aortic arch narrowing. 